Let me, let me welcome all of you for, uh, to come this afternoon to CSIS. Uh, when we have major events like this, we always begin with a little safety discussion because I am your responsible safety officer this afternoon. So if anything happens, you're going to listen to me and we're going to all be safe. We have our exits are right here in the front and we will go out and there's an emergency stairs on the side. We're going to go across the street to the Beacon Hotel and I'll buy drinks for everybody. So just follow me and everybody will be just fine. Um, let me say a very hearty welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm very, very honored to have Kimura Sensei with us today. This is a, an important opportunity, a foreign, previous, previous foreign minister, uh, now the vice chairman of the LDP and leading a very important discussion uh, inside Japan at a pivotal time. And we're very fortunate to have him here and I'm most grateful that he would be with us this afternoon. This is the 21st meeting of the uh, U.S.-Japan Security Seminar. This was a program that was started back in 1995, uh, I guess, and it was really started by my colleagues uh, Jim Kelly and Ralph Kossa out at Pacific Forum in, in Honolulu. Uh, for many years we held it in, uh, in San Francisco, and they organized it and we all flew to San Francisco, many of our colleagues here, and this year, because of this momentous visit on the part of Prime Minister Abe, uh, we felt it would be better to hold it here in Washington to provide a background for these important discussions that are going to be coming with the Prime Minister's visit. So we welcome all of you, uh, and uh, obviously Komura Sensei being here takes it to a much higher level, and we're very grateful for that. And let me also say a very, sincere welcome to uh, Ambassador Assistant Secretary Dave Scheer, who is leading uh, Asia policy in the Department of Defense. I understand that Kimura Sensei and Secretary Ash Carter had a very good meeting this morning. And I think it's all part of the preparation that we have underway as we anticipate uh, Prime Minister Abe's visit, which will be in April. This is a very important visit and for the first time uh, the Prime Minister of Japan is being invited to speak to a joint session of Congress. And I think it is an emblem of how important this relationship now is. This pivotal relationship is just central for us as we think about security and safety in Asia. We're going to get into that today and it's going to be a great opportunity for all of us to be able to get insiders view of people who are making policy. And I think we're privileged for that. And so at this stage, I would like to proceed with the program. And I would ask you to, with your applause, warmly welcome the Vice Chairman of the LDP, former Pri uh, Foreign Minister, uh, Minister Kimura. Please come to the stage. President of CSIS, Hamrein, and Japan Chair Green. Thank you for your kind introduction for me to speak uh, today at this prestigious venue. Asia is on the cusp of a major transformation. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, Asia was at the uh, center of the world econ economy and was a, a leading region for cutting edge technology. Since the late uh, 18th century, the European powers made strong by the Industrial Revolution have led, dominated the world and led world history. But Asia now is once again riding a huge wave of globalization and is set to once again be at the crest of world history. Japan, based on uh, the principle of international cooperation, is setting out um, proactive contributions to peace and the U.S. is uh, uh, setting out its um, uh, rebounds to Asia. Both of these are indispensable to Asia's peace and uh, 
prosperity. Our alliance will only become more important in the 21st century. Two years ago, Prime Minister Abe here at CSIS declared that Japan is back in a resounding manner. Getting back a strong Japan and strengthening the alliance and its deterrence, which is at the heart of our uh, diplomacy and security, are indispensable. The Abe administration is fundamentally uh, seeking to reform our security pos posture and strengthen our alliance as the joints and backbone supporting the Asia Pacific in the 21st century. Uh, strengthening this alliance is in the interest of Japan, the US, the region, and the world. Today, let me first touch on what I was deeply involved in through talks with our coalition partner, the new Kome uh, To, that is to say, the uh, new interpretation of the Constitution. Why was it necessary to reinterpret Article 9? Japan's constitution was drafted by GHQ in 1946, February. Its supreme commander was that famous General MacArthur. This war had been over for barely half a year. I don't think there were many people who were able to read the signs of the coming Cold War. Japan's constitution was drafted a month before Churchill's famous Iron Curtain speech in Missouri. And two years before the opening gong sounded of the Cold War, that is to say the Berlin blockade. General MacArthur proposed the draft to the US, uh, Japanese people that stipulated the renunciation of war. This line of thinking was the same as that of the UN Charter, which had been adopted in San Francisco in June of 1945, before the defeat of Japan. Neither was it an entirely novel concept to the people of Japan. Japan was a signatory in 1928 to the Kellogg-Briand Pact, renouncing war, named for the US Secretary of State and French Foreign Minister that advocated it. Japan was also a permanent member of the Council of the League of Nations, but the League of Nations was powerless. With the birth of the UN, the people of Japan thought that at last, humanity's ideal of the renunci renunciation of war was being realized. In General MacArthur's draft, it was also stipulated that Japan would be completely and permanently disarmed. Land, sea, and air forces and other war potential shall not be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state is not recognized. This Article 9, Paragraph 2 is so radical and a very harsh measure. At the time, no one knew how well the UN would function. But Prime Minister Yoshida, in spite of this, decided to present the draft constitution to the last imperial diet. And he declared in doing so that Japan would henceforth depend on the United Nations and renounce wars even for the purpose of self-defense. In 1947, the following year, the Japanese constitution came into force. However, after the Berlin blockade, east-west confront confrontation became definitive, and the world entered the uh, turbulent era of the Cold War, which became hot on the Korean Peninsula. In 1950, North Korea had a blitzkrieg invasion of the South, temporarily scattering the occupying U.S. forces. And the UN spectacularly failed to function. General MacArthur reversed the situation with his Incheon landing, but with China's entry into the war, the situation became a stalemate. 
It was during this time that General MacArthur decided to rearm Japan. But the Japanese constitution was very difficult to amend, requiring two-thirds majorities in both houses of the Diet and approval in a referendum. In 1952, Japan regained sovereignty, but the Korean War was still not over. The Japanese government in 1954 founded the ground air and maritime self-defense forces. A year after that, the LDP was formed. The LDP protected the fledgling self-defense forces and has continued to do so along with the U.S.-Japan alliance to the present day. Without the decisions made by those politicians of the time, we would not have the self-defense forces, we would not have the U.S.-Japan alliance, nor do I think would we have had the post-war peace and prosperity of Japan. Japanese of today ought to be deeply grateful to the uh, hard decisions made by the Japanese politicians of that era. But rearming Japan split Japanese public opinion. There were many that supported creating the self-defense forces, but many, on the other hand, feared a return to militarism and claimed the ideal of complete disarmament as their own. People that turned their back on the grim reality of the start of the Cold War began to engage in unrealistic ideals, such as uh, complete disarmament and neutrality. This played into the interests of the Soviet Union. They began to claim that the self-defense forces and the U.S. forces Japan were unconstitutional. It was the uh, grand bench of the Supreme Court in the Sunagawa, Sunakawa case of 1959 that put an end to this argument constitutionally. The court ruled that the uh, U.S.-Japan uh, security treaty was not unconstitutional. The court did not stop there. On Article 9, they stated it was, uh, they uh, made an important mention of it. The court said that it was promulgated with a sincere desire for lasting peace by the people of Japan who, as a result of the defeat of our country and reflecting upon the errors of militaristic activities committed by the government in the past, have firmly resolved that never again shall we be visited with the horrors of war through the action of the government. Then the court went on, on Article 9, Paragraph 2, the court stated that certainly there is nothing in it which would deny the right of self-defense inherent in our nation as a sovereign power. The pacifism advocated in our constitution was never intended to mean defenselessness or non-resistance. In view of this, it is only natural for our country in the exercise of powers inherent in a state to maintain peace and security, to take whatever measures, measures may be necessary for self-defense and to preserve its very existence. Further, the court wisely stated that regarding highly political issues having an extremely serious bearing upon the existence of the state, such as the management of the Japan-US alliance, the court would respect a high degree of political discretionary judgment on the part of the cabinet and the diet. Thus, they left it up to the cabinet and the diet to flesh out Japan's security policy. It was only the Supreme Court that could bring the argument back to the basic point of uh, constitutionalism, that is to say, protecting the sovereign people and protecting the existence of the state, and to set out an interpretation that would, in, in the end, uh, allow for the exercise of the right to self-defense. Only the court had the authority to establish such an interpretation. As a consequence, the cabinet and the diet have shaped Japan's security policy. Since my youth, I have wondered about the limit of this Supreme Court interpretation. Is it limited to individual self-defense, ISD? 
or does it include collective self-defense, CSD? Answering that question requires one to constantly bear in mind that the legal, legal principles of the Constitution actually protect the people of Japan and the state. It also has to be treated as a real security problem. Answering the question also requires deep insight into security policy in both its military and diplomatic aspects, deep in insight into international law, and into deep insight into the Constitution. If one is obsessed with constitutional theory, one uh, runs the risk of uh, empty talk that neglects the security of the people. On the other hand, if one focuses only on security policy, one runs the risk of slighting the Constitution. As a practical matter, the government of Japan has few human resources that are amply versed in all of these specialized fields. As for myself, I am one of the few in Japanese politics to be an expert in the law. I've twice been foreign minister, once defense minister, Also, I was responsible for deliberations on the diet for the SIASJ law, the law on situations in areas surrounding Japan, as foreign minister. Thus, whether I liked it or not, I have uh, gained a lot of experience treating serious issues at the intersection of military affairs, diplomacy, security, international law, and the Constitution. For a long time, I've constantly had to think about how to harmonize the need for effective policy protecting Japan's peace and security with the limits of Japan's constitution. The constitution says that sovereign power resides in the people. The constitution is a basic contract between the people and the government to ensure their own survival. An interpretation of the Constitution that harms the survival of the people is inadmissible. Prime Minister Abe shares this strong conviction, which is what led to our recent interpretation. Article 9 is designed to protect the people from the horrors of war. Theological debate that neglects the security of the people is inadmissible. First of all, one has to come face to face with the tough security, strategic environment that Japan faces. For many years, North Korea has pursued the development of ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. A half century ago, during the Korean War, Japan was not exposed to the threat of the North Korean army. But now, it's said that more than 200 Nodong missiles have nearly all of Japan's territory within their range. North Korea continues to seek uh, the possession of uh, chemical and biological weapons and the miniaturization of nuclear weapons. Japan started missile defense in earnest in the late 90, 90s, but missile defense alone does not provide for the complete defense of Japan. If there were a crisis on the Korean Peninsula, the U.S. would use Japanese bases to fight on the peninsula, and North Korea would fire missiles at Japan. If there were another crisis in North Korea, there could be tremendous damage to Japan. Our deterrence must be so strong that they are dissuaded from firing even a single Nodong missile. As I mentioned earlier, rearming Japan in the 1950s split public opinion. However, the verdict of history is clearly on the side of those who gave importance to deterrence. The current strategic environment shows clearly that the U.S.-Japan alliance must be further strengthened and also its deterrence. In considering Japan's peace and security, one has to touch on relations with, foreign, with uh, neighboring countries. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the normalization of relations with the ROK. Improvement in relations is desirable. For Japan, the ROK is an important neighbor it has developed its way to 
uh, be one of the 15 top economies in the world. It has a uh, top uh, size uh, army for Northeast, Northeast Asia and is a trusted ally of the United States. The Times call for a new relationship between Japan and the ROK that gives due importance to the strategic uh, significance of the relationship. Japan will persistently uh, work toward this goal. Next, on China, its rise is a historical inevitability. I am the president of the Japan-China Parliamentary Friendship League, and I'm always thinking about how to build friendly relations with China. Recently, relations have soured, and American friends often voice their concern. But from normalization in 1972 until the 1990s, Japan and China were very close, and voices of concern from America were rather concerned that Japan and China were too close. Even after the 1989 Tiananmen incident, Japan was the only country at the Houston G7 summit to oppose of placing sanctions on China. No country cooperated more than Japan in terms of uh, breaking the post-Tiananmen international isolation of China and getting China back on the right road to, de to development. In 1992, His Majesty the Emperor visited uh, China for the first time in history soon after uh, enthronement. This represented a peak in Japan-China relations. After Tiananmen, the Cold War ended, the communist world imploded, and the CCP began to seek legitimacy for its rule in economic and social development. However, along with the growth of national power, nationalism grew in China. It was about this time that history issues began to become a constant problem in East Asia. In spite of this, during the Hu Jintao era, it was agreed with the first Abe government to uh, build a mutually beneficial relationship based on cons uh, common strategic objectives. So this was about not just bilateral cooperation and friendship between the two peoples, but joint contribution to Asia and the world in a way that would expand mutual interests. Last year, President Xi Jinping affirmed that he would continue with the mutually uh, beneficial relationship based on common strategic interests, which was inherited from the Hu Jintao era. Despite difficulties, Japan intends to go about building a mature relationship with China based on mutual strategic interests. I would like to see China uh, become a country that uh, follows the rules of free trade and that respects the rule of law, as does Japan, and be a partner with us in upholding the peace and prosperity of Asia. On the other hand, there are worrisome developments. China's opaque military buildup, its maritime advancement in the East and South China Seas. For example, in 27 years, military spending in China has increased 40-fold. It's quadrupled over the past decade. In the South China Sea, they continue with land reclamation and runway construction, increasing tensions with the nations of ASEAN, such that these Chinese moves do not upset Asia's balance. The U.S.'s rebalance and friends of the U.S.'s rebalance are necessary. Candidate no number one for this is no doubt your ally, Japan. Japan, on its part, must be prepared to support the peace and prosperity of the Asia-Pacific region along with the United States. There are many new challenges that confront us. Cyberspace and outer space are creating threats that didn't exist in the Cold War era. In uh, today's world, where every problem is international, no one country can assure its own peace alone. We are sure our peace, our security, and enjoy peace for the first time when we uh, join hands with uh, like-minded countries in terms of values and interests. This brings me back to the in interpretation of the Constitution. The Japanese government founded the Self-Defense Forces and said that uh, ISD was constitutional, but until last year, somehow, 
uh, interpreted CSD as being unconstitutional. If no one country can, if a single country could protect its own peace by itself, then one wouldn't need CSD. But no such country exists on the world. Even the US, a superpower, has built many friendships and alliances. For a country without the strength to protect its own peace, to renounce CSD would mean that it uh, might have to cast aside the security of its own people were a, an enemy stronger than itself to emerge. Now, I do not think that the uh, Japanese constitution, which is there to protect the people, calls on us to protect pacifism at the expense of the people. The constitution is there to protect, it calls on us to protect the peace, not to protect pacifism at the expense of the people. If for the purposes of protecting the people and the existence of the state, then it is certainly right to exercise the right to CSD. If countries can only protect themselves by protecting one another, then certainly it's right for them to protect one another. Now, if we don't protect a certain foreign country, then let's say that um, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of our own people might be uh, fundamentally overturned. In such a case, even if we were not attacked ourselves, it would be permissible to use force to protect the foreign country. For example, let's say that there were a war that happened near Japan, and the sparks of war were about to fall on Japan, and if we did not protect U.S. naval vessels along with the U.S., then uh, the invader might eventually invade Japan. In such a case, it is certainly right to try to put out the fire before the sparks fall on the main house. In 1972, the Japanese government outlined a constitutional interpretation based on the legal reasoning of the Sunakawa case. It was a simple argument that said that uh, complete disarm under complete disarmament, one could not protect the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of the people. Article 13 of the Constitution says that the right of the people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness shall be the supreme consideration in governmental affairs. Complete disarmament and the safety of the people are incompatible. The uh, government said that it was permissible to use minimum necessary use of force to remove a violation, an imminent unlawful violation uh, tending to fundamentally overturn the right of the people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, the government said something that the Supreme Court did not say, and that is that CSD was unconstitutional. I always found that to be very odd and was bothered by it. It's not a logical conclusion. After all, in today's tough Northeast Asia security environment, Japan, it, there's no way that it can pr protect itself alone. If Japan's security cannot be assured without exercising the right to, to CSD, then to that extent, the right to exercise CSD must be allowed. It was uh, last year that uh, we reinterpreted the Constitution to make it clear that the Constitution allows for this. It took 70 years to state the obvious. Japan is now proceeding with a major reform of security legislation based on this interpretation. First, though limited, uh, it will be possible to exercise the right to CSD. Legislative reform to make this possible is proceeding under the leadership of Prime Minister Abe. Second, to protect the peace and security of Japan and of the world in the area of non-combat operations, the logistical support that we can provide to the U.S. and other forces uh, will be greatly expanded. The, the possible situations will be greatly expanded. Third, for PKOs, we will create a system adapted to modern PKOs, expanding the uh, allowable activities to include nation-building support and uh, demilitarization. Basically, it comes down to creating the legislative framework necessary for the self-defense forces to be able to uh, amply contribute to the peace of Japan and of the world. 
This will go through deliberations in the Diet, that is to say, a democratic process. Once the legislation is in, in place, Japan will be in a position to more proactively contribute to the stability of the region. The U.S.-Japan defense guidelines are being revised, and they will lay out uh, the cooperation that uh, will happen between uh, Japan and the United States. Uh, sooner or later, the results should be announced once the talks are concluded. The future guidelines will be based on existing alliance cooperation, but expand the uh, potential of cooperation globally, I believe. The U.S.-Japan Security Treaty provides for the U.S. assuring for Japan's security in exchange for the provision of bases by Japan. The U.S. will use Japanese bases to protect the areas around Japan. In the 1990s, the Cold War ended. The Soviet Union disappeared as a threat. But after this, there were the uh, crises of the North Korean uh, uh, missile development and nuclear weapon development. Japan enacted the law on situations in areas surrounding Japan. And uh, therefore, when there is a contingency near Japan, we can not uh, merely provide uh, bases to Japan, but we can also voluntarily cooperate with U.S. Uh, forces in non-combat operation. That is the what the con current guidelines stipulate. After that, we entered the 21st century. We had 9-11. The first contingency in the history of the U.S.-Japan alliance was al-Qaeda's attack on the United States. Thousands of uh, victims, including Japanese nationals, uh, lost their lives. NATO invoked its uh, CSD clause. Japan immediately sent five escort vessels to the Indian Ocean to refuel the U.S.-led international fleet. It's not very well known, but the, among the various nations sending uh, ships to the Indian Ocean, the Maritime Self-Defense Force fleet was, the, was second in size only to that of the United States. Uh, surpassing the size even of the uh, British fleet. After that, the second Iraq war broke out, and Iraq sent the ground self-defense forces to engage in humanitarian reconstruction institutions, uh, uh, reconstruction assistance. It was the first time since the uh, Second World War for ground self-defense uh, troops to set foot on the ground of a third country without wearing a UN blue helmet. They cooperated with uh, the U.S., uh, British, Australian, and Dutch uh, militaries. They were all enemies during the world, uh, Second World War. Uh, going past the loves and hatreds of the past, the uh, self-defense forces worked so that Iraqis could return to normal daily lives in cooperation with former enemies. What better uh, proof of Japan's uh, post-war walk of peace for more than half a century? The U.S.-Japan alliance now has a range that's not limited to the areas around Japan. Our alliance will uh, globally uh, sustain the peace and prosperity of the international com community. 21st century Japan is being reborn as a responsible nation that will sustain the peace and prosperity of the international community. Prime Minister Abe's proactive contributions to peace are promoting this. The uh, young people of Japan who will uh, shoulder the responsibility of our nation, I hope they will renew their pride and move into the future with confidence. Along with the guidelines revision, the TPP negotiations are at a critical stage. It will place the trading economies of Asia on a huge pan-Pacific uh, free trading uh, framework. We are about to witness the economic integration of Asia and a 21st century style, uh, truly liberated free trading uh, system. The TPP will no doubt be one of the most important wings of the 21st century trading world trade system along with the Japan, EU, EPA, and TTIP. I sincerely hope for a successful revision of the guidelines, successful TPP uh, negotiations, and the success of Prime Minister Abe's uh, visit here that will show that our alliance has reached a new dimension. Thank you.
Um, thank you. I'm Michael Green from CSIS. Uh, Minister Kumara, you've given us an uh, excellent and a compelling um, explanation of the history and the logic and the strategy um, <coughs> of uh, Japan's decision uh, to move forward and exercise uh, the right of collective self-defense. With your permission, we will um, uh, put the text of your speech on the CSIS website for anyone interested. Um, We'll now have uh, some time for question and answers. There will be people with microphones. Please keep your uh, questions brief and make sure they're questions. Um, and let me start uh, by asking uh, Komura-san. Um, my understanding is that you are um, in a key position to um, win public support uh, in Japan uh, and um, uh, move forward from the July uh, decision to recognize collective self-defense to legislation uh, in the coming uh, months. And what I wanted to ask you is, um, how do you view the public support for this uh, legislation, um, the political um, uh, landscape ahead, uh, and the prospects for passing, uh, as I understand it, more than 20 pieces of legislation to um, make this decision on collective self-defense the law uh, and then policy of Japan. Ano. At the present, the people of Japan, there are those who support uh, CSD and those who oppose it. And we still probably have uh, a few more that oppose it than support it. But it's not a question of uh, completely approving CSD. Just the minimum necessary amount to protect the existence of the state. If you put it that way, then there's a slight majority in favor, I believe. as you just said in your question. The government will draft a law, and in mid-April, the LDP and the new Komeito will reopen talks. And then the draft legislation will have to be firmed up and it will be submitted to the Diet in mid-May. The current session of the Diet is uh, set to end in uh, June. Therefore, I think we'll have to extend the session by um, a month or more. But I certainly hope to gain the understanding of the public and to have the law pass the Diet. But of course, it depends on deliberations in the department. We would like it to pass, certainly. And we hope that we can have it pass. That is our feeling. But in the actual deliberation of the legislation, when it comes to exercising the right to collective self-defense, the UN Charter allows for CSD. We wouldn't uh, have a wholesale uh, approval of, of this right, but the public would understand that it, we're only talking about a limited exercise of this right. And I believe that this will greatly contribute to the understanding of the uh, Japanese people. And when the Diet deliberate this, I believe that the public will come to understand this more and more. It's important for our alliance uh, and for uh, stability in Asia. So um, the floor is open. We have about uh, eight minutes or so. Mr. Nelson. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kummer. A very important speech and explanation of so many things. And thank you, Mike. Um, so I'm getting bounced back from myself here, which is terrifying. Uh, now that you're here in the US, are there things that you would like to hear from us 
the government, rather, with Dave Shear sitting right here, uh, uh, about how to, how to talk to our Chinese friends about the Senkakus, for example, that you're not hearing? Are, are there some things you, that you think we need to do, perhaps a better job of talking about it or, or uh, supporting you? Uh, that's been you know, some concern over the years that maybe, maybe we need to do more or say things differently. Um, are there some things that you would like to hear that you're urging, urging us to say? Thank you. The U.S. government and the Senkaku Islands has stated clearly that they fall under the Mutual Security Treaty. That's enough for now. For now. That's enough. We will go about creating good relations with China. Without uh, uh, causing trouble for the United States, I think that we'll be able to uh, protect the Senkakus. But about every month, about three times a month, China is sending government ships into the territorial waters of Japan around the Senkaku Islands. They're trying to do their best to demonstrate that Japan is not necessarily ex exercising effective control. I don't think that they will uh, go on a, a tremendous adventure. And the U.S. government has said that the Senkaku Islands fall under the U.S.-Japan security treaties, specifically Article 5. I think that's enough for now. Thank you. The um, floor is open for questions, including students uh, who need not be shy about asking questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Ryan Rainey. I'm a reporter from Inside U.S. Trade. You mentioned the TPP in your speech. Um, I just wanted to see if you believe that a bilateral deal uh, between the U.S. and Japan on agricultural and uh, agricultural goods and automobiles is possible um, before Prime Minister Abe comes in April. And is that uh, what Japan is seeking? Would you like to see a deal uh, before Prime Minister Abe's visit? Thank you. So before Prime Minister Abe's visit to the United States, I don't think it's necessarily the case that we'll have bilateral agreement by that time. But if uh, sufficient flexibility is shown, I think that a, an agreement will definitely be reached. the U.S. Congress uh, I hope will provide TPA uh, more uh, negotiating flexibility to the U.S. administration. When I speak to uh, representatives of the U.S. government, Uh, they say things like, once uh, the discussions go well with Japan, then we'll have a better chance getting TPA. But from the Japanese point of view, seeing TPA first uh, would 
basically allow for bilateral negotiations to go more smoothly without fear of having to rehash things. So it's uh, important for us to proceed uh, on both in parallel and quickly. Thank you very much. My name is Mina Pullman, and I'm a student at Georgetown University. I was wondering if you could speak more about how collective self-defense may be applied to other countries that Japan shares close security relationship with, such as Australia. Thank you. Collective self-defense, ex exercising that right, basically, the, to protect the existence of the state of Japan, exercising the right to CSD in a minimum necessary manner, and also protecting the right of the people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When there's a clear threat tending to overturn that right, that's what CSD is designed to protect against. Minimum necessary, minimum necessary collective self-defense. That's It's not limited to the U.S. Uh, forces, the scope of it. It depends on what effect there might be on Japan. Is it a minimum necessary uh, thing in order to protect the uh, existence of the state or to protect, protect the right of the Japanese people to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? That's the, uh, those are the criteria, criteria for exercising the right to CSD. Um, Minister Comer, you've had a, a short and very busy trip to Washington. Um, I understand you had excellent meetings with Secretary of Defense Carter and with the Deputy Secretary of State, and you've given us a very clear, very compelling explanation uh, of collective self-defense and defense policy reforms in Japan. So we want to wish you good luck and safe travels home. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Kanahara-san. Take it from me, they'll leave the NSC guy behind. <laughs> um, it's now my, uh, my uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce a good friend uh, uh, to me and to many of us here to give the perspective of the uh, U.S. Defense Department and the administration, um, Assistant Secretary of State um, for uh, Asia and Pacific Affairs, uh, David Shear. <clears throat> um, Dave has a uh, uh, more than three decade um, resume of uh, service in the State Department as a Foreign Service Officer. Uh, my Dai Senpai from SAIS, uh, my Dai Senpai teaching at Georgetown, <clears throat> um, a veteran of the defense guidelines uh, first round in the 1990s of um, the Korea and China desks uh, and ambassador to Vietnam, one of the um, increasingly uh, interesting and important states uh, as Asia becomes uh, more um, interconnected and more fraught with uh, complications and rivalry. Uh, and so today Dave is going to uh, speak to us and we'll have some time I think for Q&A before we let him get back to his day job at 3 o'clock. Thanks Dave.
Thank you very much, Mike. CSIS President Hamri, LDP Vice President Komura, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor but also a great challenge to follow a great statesman like LDP Vice President Komura, who's also a for former foreign minister. But I'll try. Um, as I prepared my speech last night, I realized that in a 32 or 33 year career as a diplomat, I've spent 11 years working directly on US-Japan relations. Nine of those years I spent in Japan. I wish I had the Japanese language to show for it. Um, I realized last night that while I got to be ambassador to Vietnam, I didn't get to be the deputy chief of mission in Tokyo. But that may have been just a matter of timing. Um, I realize as I look out over this audience that I learned so much of what I know about Japan and so much of what I know about diplomacy in general from many of the people who are in this audience today or uh, maybe will be watching on after the conference like Ambassadors Kato Fujisaki Sasai and Vice Minister Nishi and on the American side, Jim Kelly, Bill Breer, Tom Hubbard, Russ Deming, Jim Foster. I, I owe so much of what I have done and what I know to you all in, in this room, and I want to express my greatest appreciation for that. I, if I recall correctly, I attended the very first Pacific Forum CSIS U.S.-Japan Security Seminar at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco which took place in 1995, and I've participated in a number of them since. We've come a long way since that first seminar, but still, this event remains an important mechanism for dialogue on the U.S.-Japan alliance, and I'm hopeful for another 20 years of further success, and I very much hope that we can do another meeting in San Francisco sometime. 2015 is a very important year for U.S.-Japan relations, and among our most important agenda items is the revision of the U.S.-Japan defense guidelines. This is the document that establishes the roles and missions for U.S. and Japanese forces. I remember serving as a Paul Mill officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo when we revised the guidelines back in 1997, and I'm delighted to be back working on the revised guidelines in my new capacity as Assistant Secretary of Defense. This alliance is strong and deep, but it's also very flexible. As Japan's role in the world has evolved, and as the region has changed, our alliance has also developed and strengthened, and this evolution is captured in the successive version, versions of the guidelines. The 1978 guidelines reflected Japan's new ability, uh, increased ability to defend itself and allowed our forces to cooperate more closely in the face of the Soviet threat. The 1997 guidelines reflected the end of the Cold War in Japan's growing regional roles and interests. The new revised guidelines, or these revised guidelines made it possible for us to plan for contingency operations in the well-known situations in areas surrounding Japan, or SIAS-J. Our alliance has developed significantly since the drafting of the first 1978 guidelines and even since the 1997 revision. Today, our bilateral military engagement is robust. The capabilities of our two forces are incredibly strong and increasingly interoperable. The, revised guidelines will, the new revised guidelines will help us to respond flexibly to the challenges we face in the region as well as to further expand cooperation on global issues. A lot has changed since 1997. There are new capabilities to take stock of, new threats to consider in even new domains like cyberspace and space. The guidelines will clearly lay out how our gov governments will cooperate to continue ensuring Japan's peace and security. Our armed forces and the self-defense forces of Japan will be able to swiftly respond to situations in any phase from peacetime to contingencies that might have an important impact on Japan. To accomplish this, our governments will also significantly strengthen the bilateral, bilateral framework for coordination. 
Beyond Japan, we will cooperate in various areas to generate a more peaceful and stable international security environment. The guidelines will lay out how we will partner together to promote security and defense cooperation based on international law and internationally accepted norms. Our governments will continue to promote trilateral and multilateral security and defense cooperation with regional allies and partners. In space and cyberspace, our governments are committed to strengthening stability in these emerging domains by addressing security challenges seamlessly and effectively. In particular, we'll work with Japan to ensure the resiliency of our systems. This is a whole of government effort with the ultimate aim to secure the safe and stable use of space and the improvement of cybersecurity for critical infrastructure. Taken together, these enhancements based on Japan's new security legislation, including on collective self-defense, will allow us to achieve our vision as outlined in the 2013 2 plus 2 statement of building a more balanced and effective alliance that increases deterrence and maintains regional peace and stability. As everyone knows, Prime Minister Abe is visiting the U.S. at the end of April, and we hope to uh, complete the guidelines uh, as close to that visit as possible. Defense guidelines revision fits squarely within our overall rebalance toward the Asia Pacific. Here I want to stress, as Secretary Carter noted yesterday in his remarks at the State Department, that the rebalance is not limited to the military tools of statecraft, but it encompasses all aspects of strategy, including diplomacy and trade. It's very much a whole of government approach. Look at what we're doing in the South China Sea as an example. We're coordinating closely with ASEAN within the multilateral arena to ensure that the South China Sea remains a paramount item on the regional agenda. We're working closely with our allies and partners in Southeast Asia to help build their capacity while we encourage them to work together bilaterally as well as multilaterally. We're watching events on the water in the South China Sea while vigorously making our views and concerns known to the claimants. We're also positioning the forces we'll need to bolster stability in the region, and I note in this connection that we will have four rotationally deployed littoral combat ships in Singapore by 2018. And this will be the first time that we've had naval vessels permanently in the South China Sea since the, 19, uh, since the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken. As we do this, as we implement the rebalance, we stay in very close touch with our Japanese colleagues who have vital interests not only in the East China Sea, but in the South China Sea as well. And these are interests the United States shares with Japan at a fundamental level. A consideration of the military element of the rebalance leads us to a discussion of U.S. force posture in the region. If you need a metric for this, you need look no further than the capabilities we're basing in Japan. Consistently, DOD is placing its best equipment in Japan first, and I'd like to point out here that that approach uh, was developed by now, now Defense Secretary uh, Carter when he was uh, last in, in DOD. And here's a partial list of the capabilities we're, we're placing in Japan. MV-22 Ospreys, P-8 Maritime Patrol Aircraft, Global, Global Hawk UAVs, two TPY-2 missile defense radars, the second of which at Kyoga Misaki was just turned on in December of last year. And from 2017, the Joint stri Strike Fighter, the F-35B. In addition, we'll soon have eight ballistic missile defense capable destroyers forward deployed in Japan. And of course, our only forward deployed aircraft carrier will remain based in Yokosuka. The U.S. enjoys robust ballistic missile defense cooperation with Japan. Japan's 2014 revision of its three principles on arms exports removed barriers between our respective defense industries that will allow us to increase efficiency, reduce costs, and enable the development of advanced capabilities in joint development projects. Currently, we're jointly developing next generation SM-3 Block 2A ballistic missile interceptors for de deployment on U.S. and Japanese Aegis BMD ships. What this means is that we place a premium on Japan's defense 
by ensuring that our best, most capable platforms are in Japan as soon as possible. One thing I've learned in my 30 plus year career is that you can't talk about US-Japan alliance relations without talking about the realignment of our facilities. While we're looking to update the software of the Alliance through upgrades to the guidelines, our efforts at placing our hardware in the region is another major bilateral effort. A key part, but not the only part of this realignment of US, uh, is the realignment of US forces in Japan. From our perspective, realignment is a good story. I'll share uh, a fact with you in this regard. Four of our largest overseas peacetime military construction projects since World War II are in the Asia Pacific region. Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni, Futenma Replacement Facility, Guam, and Northern Australia. These facilities will help us maintain an operationally resilient, geographically dispersed, and politically sustainable regional posture. All of these projects are also related to our desire to reduce our footprint significantly on Okinawa to address the impact of our presence on local communities. We also have a plan with Japan to return almost 2,500 acres of land in Okinawa once we've finished consolidating our forces. We are looking forward to ensuring that the consolidation plan for our forces on Okinawa is implemented in a timely manner. A word on Guam. Of course, Guam is a focal point of this effort at realignment. And with the passage of our 2015 defense bill, all legislative restrictions on our ability to construct new, new facilities and areas on Guam have been removed. We've worked hard to gain support of Congress so that we can move forward with this necessary realignment of our forces. Japan is contributing about $3.1 billion to the projects on Guam. But the total project also requires significant U.S. funding and we'll continue to work with Congress to maintain support for our efforts to build Guam into a strategic hub in the Western Pacific. Of course, there are other challenges that affect our realignment progress, but nevertheless, we've made some good progress to include movement to the KC-130 refueling squadron from Marine Corps Air Station Futenma to Iwakuni last summer and the plan, planned return of the West Futenma housing area on April 1st of this year. This is a significant return of 128 acres of land to Japan. It's the largest return in almost a decade, and it demonstrates our continuing commitment to our bilateral plan to make our footprint in Okinawa more sustainable. As you all know, in recent days, the construction of the Futenma replacement facility has been in the news again. Despite the recent headlines, we are heartened by Prime Minister Abe's statements, as well as those of Chief Cabinet Se Secretary Suga, recognizing that the FRF at Camp Schwab in Henoko is the only solution to replace our current facility, facility at Futenma. We have good partners at the Defense and Foreign Ministries in Tokyo, and they are committed to seeing the FRF through. Lastly, I'd like to provide my thoughts on our alliance as it relates to regional cooperation. The U.S. commitment to Japan is unwavering. As Vice President Komura noted during President Obama's visit to Japan last year, the President reiterated our commitment to Japan and affirmed that Article 5 of our security treaty covers all territories under Japan's administration, including the Senkaku Islands. This sent a strong, unambiguous message to Japan and to the region. As we move forward, regional cooperation will be of utmost importance to our growing alliance. It's imperative that Japan and our regional allies and partners work together. I'm pleased with the relationship between Japan and the ASEAN countries. We also have good trilateral programs with Australia and with India. Both of those will continue to grow. That said, it is most important that the trilateral partnership among the US, Japan, and the Republic of Korea continues to show progress. I was delighted that Secretary Work, Deputy Secretary Work was able to sign a trilateral information sharing MOU with his Japan and ROK counterparts late last year. This is a good first step, but I hope that both Japan and the Republic of Korea will make 
even more strides on historical issues and build a vibrant, future-oriented partnership. With all of the changes due to happen this critical year, I look forward to working with our Japanese counterparts on all of these issues and hope that the audience stays tuned on future, I hope you all stay tuned on future developments. Our work on strengthening the alliance reaffirms that the US-Japan alliance continues to remain the cornerstone of peace and prosperity in the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting, uh, very robust uh, agenda. And, um, uh, you know, in 1995, six, when the Nye Initiative was underway, I wonder if you foresaw how busy you would make yourself <laughs> two decades later. Um, I want to ask first a question, then we'll open it up. Um, uh, I'm especially interested in the bilateral coordination mechanism <clears throat> because all of the defense guidelines review work the collective self-defense movement in Japan, the assets we're deploying, the reliance, all of it is gonna make this alliance more agile and more interoperable. <clears throat> um, but it's still not like the US ROK Alliance or NATO. We don't have a joint and combined command. So our ability to make decisions quickly together at a strategic, but also at an operational level is gonna be more and more important because the margin for error in the East China Sea or with North Korea or elsewhere is going to be narrower. So can you tell us a little bit more about the bilateral coordination mechanism and, and how you see that piece of this whole uh, strategy unfolding? You're absolutely right, Mike. Um, we don't have a combined forces command uh, in Japan as we do in Korea. So on uh, devising other creative um, and systematic ways of uh, coordinating our planning, our exercising, and uh, implementing um, uh, those plans. Um, and we established a, uh, first established a bilateral coordination mechanism in the 1998 guidelines. This was meant to be a whole-of-government approach to um, uh, conducting operations. Um, we'd like to make that bilateral coordination more effective in the new guidelines. Um, we continue to recognize the need for a whole-of-government approach. I think that was demonstrated in our combined efforts to uh, uh, address the tragedies associated with the uh, earthquake four years ago. And I think our experiences, uh, both in that earthquake, in the 1995 earthquake, um, uh, in the vicinity of Kobe, will all feed into uh, the way in which we um, uh, uh, renovate the bilateral coordination mechanism in, in the, new, the new revised guidelines. Well, again, we have microphones uh, here and in that column and here, so raise your hand and I'll... Yeah, Jim, please. <clears throat> Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim Foster from, uh, from Keio University. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, very, very nice and comprehensive. I'd like, though, perhaps if you could comment a little bit on uh, cybersecurity cooperation between Japan and uh, the United States. And in that context, too, how we can promote greater cyber threat sharing between Korea and Japan. You know, there's very, a lot of difficulties in, in, in that area. So a few comments on that would be appreciated. Thank you. Cybersecurity will be an increasingly important uh, effort, both um, uh, bilaterally with Japan and with Korea as well. And we've seen in recent uh, events like the cyber attack on Sony Pictures how important it is for us not only to uh, adopt a whole of government approach ourselves, but to coordinate our efforts with other allies and like-minded countries in this regard because cyber criminals and cyber attackers don't, don't respect uh, international borders um, and they don't respect alliances. So um, we, will, we are committed now and we will be even more committed to uh, uh, coordinating very closely with our Japanese ally on cybersecurity. This is a very complicated, uh, extremely complicated field, um, and uh, we expect that the new guidelines will allow us to sort through the many problems we face 
both individually and as an alliance in facing the cyber threat. Thank you, Ben Self with the Mansfield Foundation. Thank you so much for your remarks. And um, I wanted to ask you to stretch your mandate. I, obviously, you're Assistant Secretary for Asia and the Pacific, but we're talking about a globalized US-Japan defense partnership. And one of the transformations in the new guidelines is supposedly removing the areas surrounding Japan concept and enabling us to go beyond Asia and the Pacific to do global cooperation. Excuse me. Japan, since the Mozambique PKO, has continually contributed to global security well beyond uh, the East Asian region and in direct form through the self-defense forces in disaster relief in Haiti and in contributions to anti-piracy in the Gulf of Aden. What role do you see in this new guidelines for strengthening U.S.-Japan cooperation beyond Asia and the Pacific, particularly in areas like sub-Saharan Africa or, or conflict regions like that? Thank you. Well, our cooperation um, outside of the region is already very strong, and Japan has already been very forward-leaning in its activities outside the region, including in PKO, including in its uh, contributions to the effort against ISIL in Iraq, and in, we deeply appreciate um, uh, Japan's efforts in that regard, as do uh, the regional victims of, of ISIL's terror. Um, Japan, of course, um, has operated in the uh, warships in the Gulf of Aden and has worked with us in, in resupplying our vessels in the Gulf of Aden. So we already have a strong basis on which to build uh, closer, closer uh, bilateral activities outside the region. And uh, in addition to uh, addressing the issue of SIASJ, I expect the, the new guidelines will put in place um, uh, not only the bilateral coordination mechanism, but the mechanisms by which we will uh, more effectively, more seamlessly be able to plan, train, and operate together outside of the region in a variety of circumstances. Uh, Patrick? Michael, thank you. Dave, thank you for those comments, especially clarifying the many partnership capacity building activities in, say, Southeast Asia. And I really want to ask you a question about the role of the alliance in the South China Sea. I had a discussion as early as, uh, or as recently as this morning with Chinese interlocutors warning me against allowing Japan to have a, any security role in the South China Sea. When I compare what Japan is doing in building, say, coast guards in the region versus China building artificial islands in a nine-dash line, which one of those two seems to be more stabilizing? D does the alliance and, and does Japan have a role to play in security in the South China Sea? I believe uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance, and I've always said the U.S.-Japan alliance is critical to peace and stability in the region, and that doesn't just mean Northeast Asia. That doesn't just mean Northeast Asia. Um, it means Southeast Asia and the South China Sea as well. As part of that effort, um, partner capa capacity building um, is critical. And that, I think that's going to be a fundamental part of both the US and Japanese uh, uh, efforts um, in the South China Sea. Um, uh, as ambassador to Vet Vietnam, I work quite closely with uh, my Japanese colleagues in the Japanese embassy in coordinating our efforts in uh, Vietnam. I think that coordination uh, is also taking place regionally, and I think you're going to see not only stronger U.S. and Japanese partner uh, uh, capacity building uh, in the uh, area surrounding the South China Sea, but you're going to see stronger U.S.-Japan coordination in this area. Peter? Thank you, sir. Um, looking ahead to uh, the Prime Minister's upcoming speech to the Congress, um, do you anticipate that the speech will enhance or, and contribute to uh, trilateral cooperation between the ROK, Japan, and the U.S., or might it in some way uh, cause problems for that relationship? And in particular, do you uh, expect that the Prime Minister will speak to, will uh, use specific language that might enhance the relationship or might omit certain language that might uh, cause some problems? I can't predict what the Prime Minister will say in his speech, I, I don't have that kind of foresight. 
Um, but Prime Minister Abe has shown himself to be a man of great vision um, and a man of peace um, in past public remarks. And I have no doubt that he will again demonstrate that um, uh, in his public remarks in the United States. Um, he has been very forward-leaning and future-oriented uh, in previous remarks, and I would uh, imagine that he will be so in his remarks in the U.S. For those of you who haven't seen it, there's a really interesting column by David Ignatius in this morning's post about this, based on his discussions with the Prime Minister, um, and I would encourage you to look at it. Um, Noboru Yamaguchi. David, good to see you, and uh, thank you very much for your service. Again, for the next guidelines. Thank you very much for that. Uh, on, on the guidelines, um, there are expectations among Japanese uh, to see uh, better uh, cooperation um, between two countries in case of so-called gray zone issues. And I, I, my, uh, as far as, as I understand, the Japan, uh, Japan side's problem is to make laws. Um, gray zone means uh, beyond the police capability and below army to a a military, military conflict. That there, 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 there is a lack uh, of uh, legal basis uh, for, for law, enforce, law enforcement uh, organizations uh, as well as self-defense forces uh, to deal with that, uh, that range of uh, issues. So uh, for the Japanese, it's a legal problem. Um, as uh, um, we, we have to, as many steps as possible uh, to deal with, um, the, to, to, to avoid uh, too much uh, uh, deep uh, to, in case of, uh, uh, or escalation, too much ex escalation. And my question is, uh, uh, what are the challenges for the, the U.S. side uh, when we, um, if we, we mean the Japanese side says we need to, to, uh, to deal with uh, gray zone? Yes. Um, uh, in our uh, U.S.-Japan Defense Guidelines Interim Report that w uh, Japan and the U.S. issued last year, you probably noticed that we used the words seamless and efficient coordination a lot. And what we mean by seamless and efficient coordination, um, we apply that to all aspects of the alliance. We want seamless and efficient coordination um, between Japan and the U.S. as allies. We want seamless and efficient coordination among our various agencies as we organize ourselves in a whole of government fashion. And we want seamless and efficient coordination uh, not just in war, but across the spectrum of situations from peace to crisis to war including in those situations um, our Japanese friends uh, term gray zone situations. So um, uh, seamless and efficient coordination is a key phrase in our approach to the new guidelines. And um, as it applies to gray zones, it means seamless coordination across all kinds of contingencies from peace to war, from humanitarian uh, assistance and disaster relief to full-scale defense of Japan in case of war. Well, as I mentioned, Sorry, I just want to make sure. Could everyone hear that? I'm not sure the microphone was on. Okay. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned um, in my remarks, we strongly welcomed um, the conclusion of the trilateral uh, information sharing information sharing agreement among uh, Korea, Japan, and the U.S. Um, and I think there are uh, opportunities for further such arrangements. Um, I think. I think we have to be um, uh, realistic and patient in how we, we approach this. 
uh, given the sensitivities. Um, but uh, we've seen um, as we as we work through the uh, the uh, information sharing agreement that trilateral cooperation is quite possible, and I'd be uh, happy to. I think you'll find us looking for further opportunities, not yet defined, to uh, uh, cooperate trilaterally. My name is Kunio Kikuchi, and I'm with uh, Washington Research and Analysis. Um, about Okinawa, uh, 70 years ago, almost to the day and the month, uh, Okinawa was facing this largest armada of American forces. And in the following uh, month or so, the U.S. Marines would have killed more than 100,000 civilians plus 100,000 or more uh, military on that small island. And to this day, the U.S. Marines occupy 20% of the island. Now, uh, the, the Okinawans, first of all, blame the Japanese intransigence of the Japanese government that sacrificed them, uh, as it were, for the uh, ground uh, war. But um, now when you talk about Futemba and how the Japanese government is trying uh, everything to make sure that the relocation would go through, uh, this flies in the face of the recent uh, uh, election of the governor who won on the basis of not permitting the relocation of Futema on yet another site within Okinawa. The only gracious exit for this crisis or this uh, impediment would be for the U.S. government uh, to say, look, uh, the relocation of Futema to Henoko is already more than 19 years old and it might be time to reconsider. Uh, is there such a possibility? Thank you. Thank you very much. I first visited Okinawa in February 1974 when I was a student in Japan. Um, I have visited Okinawa many times since, um, uh, also in my capacity as a political military officer in the State Department and in U.S. Embassy Tokyo. I've worked closely um, with the people of and the government of Okinawa to uh, realign our facilities and to uh, mitigate the effects of our operations on uh, the people who live in Okinawa. And um, I was engaged in the 1990s in the um, joint effort to devise the SACO process, which was a, a significant effort to realign our facilities and bases in, in Okinawa. And I continue to be very, very um, engaged in that process. Let's remember that the Futenma replacement facility is an effort by the US and Japanese governments to, um, to close Futenma airfield, to move, move marine uh, assets out of Futenma air, airfield to a re replacement facility so that we can return um, the Futenma facility and so that we can, by building the replacement facility, reduce the impact of continued operations, uh, marine air operations in Okinawa on the people of Okinawa. And um, we work with the Japanese central government um, in, in this issue. We appreciate the efforts of the, the central government in uh, providing us facilities in Okinawa and in helping us to build the Futenma replacement facility. Um, we've looked at lots of alternatives and we've d decided um, uh, with great um, care that Futenma replacement facility in Camp Schwab is the best place for us to be both operationally and in terms of the, the extent to which it reduces the the effect, the negative effects of our presence on the people of Okinawa. One more question. Yeah, we have time for one more, and it will have to be uh, brief, uh, please. So, yes, ma'am, keep it very brief. Thank you. 
Jane from China Sina Corp. Um, as you mentioned, it's a critical year for U.S. and Japan relation, and um, on matters such as anniversary of the World War II, um, China, South Korea, or Russia tend to uh, be historical focus and are not quite dismissive of past transgression. At the same time, Japan tend to focus more on the future. So which way do you think the US leans and uh, or should lean on matters of historical significance? Thank you. Well, the 70th anniversary of the end of the war is certainly an important uh, event, not only in Northeast Asia, but globally. Um, uh, the U.S. recalls the tragedies of World War II, but we also, since 1945, have made a strong point um, in, in looking forward. And if we are oriented in one direction more than another, it's certainly in the forward-looking direction. That certainly has um, uh, strengthened our relations with our allies, it has strengthened peace and stability in the region, and I think that forward-looking approach has also helped uh, China prosper. So I hope that the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese, along with us, can all turn f forward and look to the future as we recall the tragedies of World War II. Um, Dave uh, has to get back to his day job. You have a lot of senpai in the audience. You have, a lot of, you have a lot of kohai in the audience. We're all grateful for what you're doing, and we should let you get back to your job. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have coffee in the back, and we're going to resume at 3.15.